Tonight, two former star cabinet ministers kicked out of caucus. The team has to trust each other. That trust has been broken. Jody Wilson-Raybould and Jane Philpott are no longer Liberals. Tonight, their reaction, the political fallout, and where this leaves the SNC-Lavalin affair. I won the lottery and received a transplant. Nova Scotia moves to make all residents automatic organ donors, but should a government presume consent? As scientists warn Canada is warming fast, we're on the ground with crews preparing for climate extremes. Is Canada ready for it? This is The National. The Prime Minister finally made his move today after weeks of being haunted by the SNC-Lavalin controversy and openly questioned by two of his own team members. Today, he expelled them from caucus. Jane Philpott says she's disheartened. Jody Wilson-Raybould says she has no regrets. Both had resigned from Cabinet. Decisions tied to allegations the Prime Minister's office inappropriately pressured Wilson-Raybould when she was Attorney General. Tonight, we are getting a new view of that part of the story, too. We'll sort through newly released messages between Wilson-Raybould and former Trudeau advisor Gerald Butts. And we'll put all of this to at issue. Is the Prime Minister's decision today enough to turn the page? But let's start with what Justin Trudeau hopes is the end of this story. After consulting with his caucus, it was the Prime Minister who told his team he had removed the two MPs despite their pitch to remain Liberals. Katie Simpson begins our coverage tonight. The Prime Minister is trying to make the case that he had no choice but to act. The trust that previously existed between these two individuals and our team has been broken. Whether it's taping conversations without consent or repeatedly expressing a lack of confidence in our government and in me personally as leader, it's become clear that Ms. Wilson-Raybould and Dr. Philpott can no longer remain part of our Liberal team. Jody Wilson-Raybould and Jane Philpott were both told this afternoon they had officially been kicked out of caucus, a decision that came after a series of meetings where Liberals raised concerns about Wilson-Raybould's decision to secretly tape a key conversation in the SNC-Lavalin affair. When that cabinet minister is the Attorney General of Canada secretly recording the clerk of the Privy Council, it's unconscionable. Both Wilson-Raybould and Philpott put up a fight to the very end. I face uh, each uh, day as it comes and continue to work as, as hard as I can for the people of Vancouver Granville as a member of uh, the Liberal Party. The former Attorney General made a broad appeal to her colleagues with a defiant two-page letter pleading her case while Philpott tried a more personal approach. Do you want to stay in the Liberal Party? I have to go into a meeting and starting right now. So. At an earlier emergency meeting of Ontario Liberal MPs, she told the room she has confidence in the Prime Minister and that she wanted to stay. Both pitches ultimately failed. The trust has been broken uh, by two members. It's not a, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a kind of a sad night, but uh, it is something we had to do. Prime Minister has made a very difficult decision, uh, something that none of us are particularly happy about, uh, but we need to move on. In a statement tonight, Philpott says she is profoundly disheartened and denies she is disloyal. On the contrary, I recommended that the government acknowledge what happened in order to move forward. In tweets, Wilson-Raybould says she will take time to reflect on what has happened. I have no regrets. I spoke the truth, as I will continue to do. Justin Trudeau will now try to do everything he can to put this saga behind him and his team, something he's been unable to do for nearly two months. Our political opponents win when Liberals are divided. We can't afford to make that mistake. Canadians are counting on us. Getting past this story is not going to be easy. Tomorrow, Trudeau will have to defend his decision to kick two women out of caucus when more than 300 young women will be on Parliament Hill for an event that encourages more women to get into politics. Rosie. 
Okay, Katie, the Prime Minister mentioned his opponents uh, in that speech there. The opposition, I gather, has already jumped on all of this. The Conservatives have really been preparing for this moment and are already attacking Trudeau for kicking out two people who stood up to him and who are seen by some as whistleblowers. And they will continue to question whether Trudeau is a feminist since it is two women from his inner circle who are now gone. Rosie. Okay, Katie, thanks for this reporting tonight. Appreciate it. Thanks. So, what happens to Jody Wilson Raybould and Jane Philpott now? Starting tomorrow, they'll be sitting in the Commons Chamber in the back corner as independents, not tied to a political party. The two can still run in the upcoming election, just not as liberals, as the Prime Minister made clear today as well. They could appear on the ballot as independents, or they could try to run for another political party, but there's certainly no indication they do that for now. That election is just six months away. So just how are the constituents in their ridings feeling after today's developments? But I think she has a lot of support, Canadian support for being so um, forthcoming and honest and, and showing a lot of respect for Canadians. Integrity is missing in politics. And for someone to stand up for um, what she believes in. It takes a lot of guts. If uh, people stand for the truth, I think uh, they should be supported. Um, instead uh, of being kicked out like this, I think that puts more fear in anyone else who wants to speak out. I mean, it's good to have a variety of voices in the Liberal Party. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know, really. I, I mean, I can understand that they probably feel that she's, you know, not being one of the team, but sometimes, you know, it takes time to work together again, right? Remember that at the very core of all of this, the allegation from Wilson-Raybould that she was pressured over to, uh, pressured to consider a deal for SNC-Lavalin by the Prime Minister's office. That includes former top Trudeau advisor Gerald Butts, who sees the whole affair very differently. And today we got another look into their conversations, thanks to some newly released text messages between them sent during a six-week period that ended when she was shuffled from her job as Justice Minister. David Cochran takes us through what's in them and what's not. At the heart of Jody Wilson-Raybould's story is that she lost her job as Attorney General because of SNC-Lavalin. That I stated I believe the reason was because of the SNC matter. They denied this to be the case. I firmly believe that nothing inappropriate occurred here and nothing inappropriate was alleged to have occurred until after the cabinet shuffle. Jerry Butts sent notes and text messages to the Justice Committee to bolster his claim. Text related to a December 5th meeting where their testimony is at odds. Minister Wilson-Raybould solicited the meeting with me. She also raised the subject with me. I wanted to speak about a number of things, including up bringing up SNC and the barrage of people hounding me and my staff. We parted that meeting as friends and colleagues and exchanged personal text messages a couple of hours later. I wrote, nice to see you. She replied, nice to see you too. Thanks for the convo. Please say hello to the PM. The texts from that night are as Butts said. No obvious signs of tension, no mention of SNC. A follow-up text from Wilson-Raybould on December 11th doesn't mention it either. On January 7th, the Prime Minister called Wilson-Raybould on vacation in Bali to discuss the cabinet shuffle. Butts listened in and took notes. I feel I'm being shifted out of justice for other reasons, Butts quotes her as saying. We would not be doing this if it weren't for Scott's decision, Trudeau replies, referring to Scott Bryson's resignation from cabinet. I don't agree, she replied. That's not how we change people's lives. There's no mention of SNC in Butts' notes or in the text exchange that followed, though Wilson-Raybould raised objections. At the time, Indigenous protesters were blocking a gas pipeline. She raised this, not SNC. Pushing me out, which will be the perception whether true or not, is terrible. It will be confounding and perplexing to people. This is not about me. This is about an approach to Indigenous peoples. The bulk of the text show the minister and Butts trying to connect across multiple time zones. The tone seems cordial, but on January 12th, it changes. 
What is being proposed is a mistake, she texts. There is no way to fully explain this. My eyes are wide open on this shift. The night before the shuffle, she follows up. No, I will be prepared for tomorrow, and I know why this is happening. Butts replies, Yes, you do, because the PM told you why this is happening. We plan on saying the truth. Scott's departure left a large hole. At no point in these text exchanges does she directly mention SNC or a DPA, two things Ottawa hasn't stopped talking about since. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. So what does today's move show us about how the government manages its caucus and is it enough for the government to try and turn the page for good on all of this? Time for a special Tuesday at issue. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto tonight. Althea Raj is in Ottawa and Ottawa's bureau chief, the CBC's bureau chief, Rob Russo, also here in Ottawa. Good to see everyone. Let's, uh, let's start, I think, with what we think was the final straw for the caucus and for the prime minister. Uh, Andrew, what, what would you assess? How would you assess that? Well, I'm not sure that their claim that it has anything to do with taping is actually what was precipitated this. What precipitated is that the, um, um, from, from among other things, Jane Philpott never engaged in any taping. What in, in precipitated is the two of them are critical of the prime minister on a particular issue, which is the attempt to interfere with a criminal prosecution, which the prime minister doesn't even much bother to deny anymore. They just simply say it's not wrong for him to have done so. It is a peculiar ethical compass, it seems to me, that says that when such allegations are raised, what should happen is the whistleblower should be drummed out of caucus rather than the prime minister answering the serious questions that have been raised by this. Uh, I understand why the prime minister himself would feel that way. It's a little stranger to see members of caucus, members of parliament, whose job constitutionally is to hold government to account, instead deciding to hold the whistleblowers to account. I, I would expect it has something to do with the fact that they felt that their jobs were under threat. Uh, Althea, you were in that room today. It certainly, uh, you know, I mean, realize it was, a, a, you know, a partisan activity, but people <laughs> seemed relieved to some extent. Whether it changes things materially, I don't know. Yeah, I would say the MPs who have had more than one term under their belt were really relieved to see the Prime Minister take the stand and were egging him on and nodding along uh, with his speech and, you know, leaping to their feet to give him a standing ovation. Some of the newer faces uh, were a little bit more difficult to read, frankly. And uh, I think that kind of speaks to the nature of the caucus discussions. It was interesting that there wasn't actually a vote of the National Caucus that this decision was taken after um, the Ontario Caucus for sure is uh, the group decision was to get rid of uh, the two women but that the Prime Minister made this decision there was no like oh 10 percent thinks that uh, the, yeah. these MPs should stay um, I agree with Andrew that I think that the uh, tape is a convenient excuse. I think the reason why uh, the Prime Minister took the decision he made today is because caucus was adamant that he do so and his own leadership of caucus was um, in some ways in trouble yeah. because he was refusing to act. Rob, why, why do you think it happened today and not uh, many days ago? Dave, David Cochran's walking around saying it's on 54 days he thought <laughs> he, he decided to make this, uh, you know, big decisions in terms of leadership. Well, I, I, I do think there are a couple of reasons. Number one, there, there are some MPs who say that this was the proverbial straw that cracked the camel's back. But I, I think when you strip it all away, uh, it's that keenly felt sentiment of democratic, uh, democratically elected politicians everywhere. It's naked self-interest. A, a lot of them felt that uh, that Ms. Uh, Wilson-Raybould and Dr. Philpott were endangering their chances of actually holding on to their jobs, holding on to their seats, and they told them so. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, Dr. Philpott was told at an Ontario caucus a couple of weeks ago uh, by some of her colleagues who looked her right in the eye and said, you are going to cost me my job. Mm -hmm. So it was naked self-interest. Uh, 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 now, as to why they moved today, uh, quite frankly, I think it's because it took this long for the Prime Minister's office, and I, I know that they all went to great lengths to make this look like this was a caucus decision, but mm -hmm. it really was the Prime Minister's office who was involved in engineering a lot of this by talking to caucus chairs and saying, uh, okay, we have to get this done, here's how we're going to have it done, and here's when we're going to have it done. I think today's timing is very important because of some events tomorrow. So yeah. uh, uh, they wanted to get it done. They wanted to get it done on a certain timetable, and they wanted to hang on to their skins. Okay, well, that, 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 that speaks to, I think, the, the other part of this that it may offer us some, some light on, on Justin Trudeau's leadership. I, I want to play another little clip that he uh, made to caucus and to Canadians today. Here's what he had to say about sort of uh, caucus and unity. In learning to new, do new things and doing them differently, 
we encounter difficult moments because doing new things, doing different things is hard and we're not always going to be perfect. I mean, that was pretty telling, I thought, Andrew, because this was supposed to be a prime minister who did things differently than Stephen Harper. And I wonder what we should take from that comment and, and how this day has ended. Well, clearly, if anything, this, this caucus and this party is under tighter control than under Stephen Harper. I think Rob makes this very point very well. The, the notion that this was, this was some kind of apprehended caucus revolt and an unwilling prime minister was forced to lower the boom on people who had been a thorn in his side throughout this affair, I think strikes me as fanciful. But whether it was or it was not, I'm struck by the fact that nobody alleges that, any, that either woman is not telling the truth that when they allege that a, a serious effort was made to interfere with a criminal prosecution, everyone just brushes past that, waves it aside as if it was inconsequential, and just talks about the optics. Uh, we're through the looking glass here. That is not how our system is supposed to work. It's certainly not the case in other countries that it's a, uh, an offense worth drumming you out of the party that you happen to disagree with the leader or be critical of the leader. That is only in Canada where we've allowed the caucus and the party to become essentially emanations of the leader, wholly the creatures of the leader almost, but, where but he has to sign yeah. the nomination papers for you. But, but isn't that because fundamentally they, they do not believe that they were interfering in anything, that they believe that they were allowed to have a public policy decision, a, a conversation about this, and Jody Wilson-Raybould never at any point explained why she wasn't going to do it. Well, she did explain to the Prime Minister pretty explicitly September 17th and to his subordinates on repeated occasions after that. Look, I can't get into the state of mind of the Prime Minister whether he honestly believed he was interfering with the prosecution or not. It seems to me that when credible allegations are made about that, we don't just throw up our hands and say, kick him out of caucus, we get to the bottom of it. The, this party and this government have done everything they could to thwart that, so I'm less inclined to give them the benefit of the doubt on that score. Yeah, I, I didn't mean that she didn't raise the issue of interference. I meant that she has never explained uh, to the Prime Minister, to, to my knowledge anyway, why she was not willing to consider She's, the DA. She is, the Attorney General is not obliged to, to answer to the Prime Minister for the conduct of a particular okay, prosecution in any, any way, shape, okay. or form. Okay, Rob. Well, I, I think to get back to that clip that, 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 you, yeah. uh, that you played in the, in the first uh, uh, part there, where he, he said, if you try to do politics differently, these kinds of things are going to happen. I, I can tell you there, there is an active debate about some of the people who are around the prime minister as to whether or not he should continue to try and do politics differently. That, that lots of people who are saying, uh, look, when were you effective? You were effective when you bashed Patrick Brazo, the senator, around a boxing ring. You were effective when you wheeled on Stephen Harper in the first debate on the first question and planted one between, uh, uh, on him between the eyes. So, uh, look, you're, you're in a fight for your life. You're in a fight for your for government. Uh, uh, go ahead and brawl, because you know what? You, you might need to. You might, uh, you might have to, because a lot of things aren't working right now. Sunny ways aren't working right now. Yeah. Numbers are down for the Liberals. Their own polls are telling them there's some alarming things happening in Atlantic Canada and British Columbia. So go ahead and be a brawler. Others are saying that's just not going to work. Um, uh, and go back to trying to be, in effect, the unicorn who belches up bubbles of Chanel Number no. Five. Okay, uh, uh, Althea, what what do you make of this as a lesson of in Justin Trudeau's leadership or a test thereof? Um, I think we have to be honest. There is no way that uh, Prime Minister Harper would have waived cabinet conf con uh, confidences and allowed former cabinet ministers to go testify at a committee. This would have been shut down behind closed doors, and this would have been a, a very short-term story. So I think, in some ways, doing politics differently, if that's what we want to believe from the line coming out of caucus meeting today, mm -hmm. really turned out to be doing politics stupidly. Um, that being said, I think that we also, just to Rob's earlier point, I don't think it's just naked self-interest. I think there are legitimate questions to be asked uh, about the motivation behind these two members of parliament. Yeah. They are either incredibly naive. If this is really, if their story is to be believed, they really thought that they were blowing the whistle and something that they felt was really inappropriate. The consequences of their actions, the sort of, the saying that I'm speaking truth to power and that resignation or that demotion letter, if we're supposed mm -hmm. to call that, in January, which was catnip for reporters, the arranging of interviews during the budget week. Like, there is no other way to see that, either that you are completely naive or there's a personal agenda at play here. If you were really acting ethically, honorably, on principle, you would have quit in September at the meeting when the prime minister asked you to do something that you felt was partisan. Mm -hmm. If the story is to be believed that 
uh, you wanted to keep, and this is you being Jody Wilson Raybould here, yes. wanted to keep the position of AG because she wanted to prevent the government from doing something inappropriate. She, who says herself she takes copious notes of everything, yes. would have paper trailed. She would have written a letter, stop bugging me about this issue. Yeah, yeah. I am not doing this. Or, I would have written yeah. emails saying, put your your god dark guard dogs away. You know what I mean? Yes. There would or, be a record there, and yes. there is not. So I think that that is why a lot of liberal MPs yes. are wondering what is really the play here. Yes. We don't or, understand. Or, That's what or, or she could have, Andrew, uh, she could have released that tape uh, from Hordick much earlier. Uh, if this if this was an issue uh, where she and she felt that that was an evidence of being pressured and clearly she did I don't know why it took so long for that tape to be released well partly because Wernick denied what she said in, in testimony that he had said to her he, she, he denied that he threatened her for example so I imagine she kept he kept she kept the tape and made the tape because she was anticipating both that the conversation would be improper and that they would be, they would not tell the truth about it. Anyway, so the, ta the what tape her is motives, yeah, what yeah, her motives yeah. or her agenda or anything have to do with the truth or falsity of her allegations, it seems to me is a deflection. The allegation's been made and it's been confirmed in most of its respects that the Prime Minister attempted to, to pressure, to change her mind, to get her to, to uh, make a different decision on a matter that is wholly the, the business of the Attorney General of Canada. Uh, I, I, we just have to keep focused on what is actually relevant here rather than what's fun but to discuss. Andrew, people are of different opinions on that issue. You firmly believe one thing, but there are other people who don't agree with you. I, I, the, the, the difference of opinion is not whether it happened, it's whether it's wrong. That's fine. Yeah. Let's debate that. But let's yeah. not get into motives when they're not, they don't go to the germane question, which was, what did the Prime Minister say? What did Mr. Wernick or say? what is the we appropriate what extent Wern of that influence? We know what Mr. Wernick said because we have the tape. If we didn't have the tape, they'd still be denying it. But, but I guess the problem and what we've realized here is to have the conversation that you think is, is warranted, Andrew, and I, th I think you're probably right. You cannot do it in a context in, in, in which we are and have been for the past 54 days. You cannot have a reasonable, logical conversation about where is the line in a conversation like this. You could have called witnesses to the Commons Justice Committee the day after yes. the story broke. Instead, what they, had, what they first tried to do was not to call any witnesses except for the clerk and the president attorney general. Then they reluctantly called a couple other witnesses. They called some twice, some yes. once, some not at all. Yes. So yeah, the process has dragged out. That's been the strategy. Well, and, I, I, and, and the prime yes, minister story, the, the prime minister story has evolved on this. This was false of course, accusations, of course. and and then it went to some mistakes were made. Yes. Look, I, I think no matter what happens, there are people around the prime minister and in the caucus who thinks that the talons in in the prime minister's liver are now out. I'm not sure that that's true. Okay. At a minimum, seats are in peril. The Liberals' okay. numbers are down, yep. and the public has some real hard questions about Justin Trudeau and the okay. Liberals. I, I gotta go. Thank you all. Thanks for coming in on a Tuesday. So, where is the story going next? We don't know, but anyway, you can stay in the know with the At Issue podcast. And of course, and this will be helpful to get a bit of distance from all this, we'll be back with another At Issue on Thursday night. So, stick around for that. Okay. Ian, Andrew, there has been other news, and you're watching the rest of tonight's video. No, I think you can go on with the panel for another 20 minutes. That's why. <laughs> I mean, uh, there is lots ahead, uh, starting with a big change in Nova Scotia to organ donations. You depend on something else to live. Why, it'll soon be the first province where you'll have to opt out instead of in. We're definitely much busier. And we'll hear from firefighters on the front lines of climate change, preparing for more extreme fires. And as police make an arrest tonight in the killing of Nipsey Hussle, we'll take you to the rapper's L.A. neighborhood. We about to go backwards like, who else will come out here and open up their own business in the community? All that ahead on The National. So we will need a further extension of Article 50, one that is as short as possible and which ends when we pass a deal. Theresa May is still having no luck passing her Brexit deal through Parliament, so she'll be asking the European Union for yet another extension. The UK has until April 12th to propose a plan to the EU, which then needs to be accepted or it will leave without a deal. The current proposal has been voted down twice in Parliament. Charges have now been laid over the kidnapping of Chinese international student Wan Zhen Lu in Ontario. Abdullah He Adon turned himself into police overnight after a Canada-wide warrant was issued yesterday. 
He's one of four suspects accused of forcing Lou into a van March 23rd, and police have a message for the remaining three. It's time to seek legal counsel and turn yourself in. And our investigators are closing in on them, and it's only a matter of time before they're in custody as well. Lou was found outside a house three days after he went missing. Investigators say there was a ransom demand made, but won't say what it was. In the near future, almost every adult in Nova Scotia will automatically become organ donors after they die. It will be a presumed consent. When this bill uh, becomes law, it will no longer be a question of registering to be an organ donor. We will all be considered to be organ donors. So that's the Premier today announcing he's tabled new legislation that will basically turn the current system on its head. So right now, if you want to be an organ donor in this country, you have to opt in by filling out a form that gives consent. But this new legislation, as you heard, will put the onus on Nova Scotians to opt out. The law will be the first of its kind in North America, but other countries have taken a similar approach. So how do you feel about being an organ donor by default? Vicodopia weighs the pros and cons. Those are the plastic cables. Through these tubes, two liters of solution pump through Marcel Rosen's body, the doing the critical okay. job of his kidneys, which and barely work. And Marcel's father perished in Auschwitz. For someone who survived the Holocaust, daily dialysis doesn't feel like living. Your life is at a standstill. You, 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 you have to, you depend on something else to live. Rosen is so desperate to find a kidney donor, last year his wife Julia resorted to posting flyers. It's, it's frustrating, okay? I don't know what else can I do. Rosen is among the more than 4,000 Canadians waiting for an organ transplant, and hundreds die every year after not getting one. While almost 90% of Canadians support organ donation, only 20% have signed up. Several European countries have long had presumed consent, improving transplant rates. But will what works in Europe work in Canada? I'm not sure it's a great fit for Canadian society. This bioethicist questions whether a country as diverse as ours would embrace presumed consent mm. and whether people will know to opt out. Is this truly an informed decision of an individual? And I think with something like opt out or presumed consent, it may not be. Canadians have shown a willingness to act on organ donations. When Logan Boulay was killed, six people received transplants, and then nearly 100,000 Canadians signed up to be donors. But registrations have tapered off. For those in the organ transplant field, all eyes are now on Nova Scotia. I hope this facilitates those people to become donors who didn't make their wishes known ahead of time. At the same time, you have to protect people who don't wish to donate. Presumed consent would improve the odds of a kidney transplant for Marcel Rosen. I think it's a good idea. As it stands, he doesn't know how long he'll have to wait. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. Now, the Nova Scotian government says it'll be at least 12 to 18 months before the bill actually becomes law. They want time to educate and train healthcare professionals on organ donation. It's also worth noting the law will not apply to people under 19 or to those who are unable to consent for themselves. Okay, let's follow up now on an important story about uh, climate change. That stark report warning Canada is heating up twice as fast on average than the rest of the planet. And Andrew, today harsh words on who's to blame. The Environment Commissioner says she finds it disturbing how little Canada has done. Canada needs to get ready to adapt to a changing climate and must do more to achieve our goals of reducing greenhouse gases. Julie Gelfand criticized liberal and conservative governments over the years for failing to reach their own greenhouse gas emission targets. In one of her final audits, she takes aim at the current government for not keeping a promise to scrap some oil industry subsidies. When will this government take bold action to take on catastrophic climate change? Well, Minister of Environment. Speaker, I absolutely agree we need bold action, and that's exactly what we do. We have a Canada is 90 million tons short annually of meeting its 2030 emissions target. The climate change report warns the risk of wildfires will only grow. Friar Stewart takes us to B.C. now, where firefighters are already adjusting to the new normal. As a helicopter hovers above the ground, crews practice how to descend into a fire zone. 
prepping for what could be another busy season. We kind of use the hover exit as a, a last resort if there's no other options to get into the fire. Well, they're training about 200 kilometers to the northwest. Others are already dealing with the real thing as a fire burns near Squamish. In the past two years, BC has seen its worst wildfire seasons on record. Huge sections of the province burned and smoke wafted far and wide. A little bit lighter and, and then we move Which is why departments are now preparing for what could be round three. A set of coveralls that uh, the guys would wear their... Gerald their moment, Bastin uh, is chief of the Agassiz Fire Department. department. Yeah. In addition to fighting a large fire near the community last year, his team was deployed across the province. We're definitely much busier and definitely have many more man hours and uh, expect more from our volunteers and task our volunteers on a regular basis. And the outlook isn't good. Northern BC is one of the places in Canada that's seeing some of the highest increases in temperature. Even like five years ago, we we're looking at the climate models, we we're thinking we had time. Things were going to change gradually. Things changed just like that. Fire ecologist Robert Gray says it's not enough for individual homeowners to try and take precautions. Entire forests have to be thinned out and carbon emissions have to be significantly curbed. So we have to have some really big transformational changes in a lot of different parts of the economy and society to solve this problem. How confident are you that that's going to happen? Uh, not very. Um, there's so much uh, inertia against making big changes. The type of drastic actions that he believes are really necessary to try and reverse the already destructive trend. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Hope, BC. Those two record-breaking wildfire seasons have led to a 58% bump in BC's firefighting budget this year. That's $101 million to help reduce wildfire risks in affected communities and to pay for more crews and equipment. Well, today we gained startling new insight into the deadly collapse of an outdoor stage in Toronto seven years ago, just hours before a Radiohead concert. At an inquest today, the man whose company built the stage made a dramatic admission that this was all an accident waiting to happen. Katie Nicholson has the details that stunned the courtroom. Every summer for nearly 30 years, this stage went up in Ontario. But behind the nuts and bolts, a dangerous problem that took the life of Scott Johnson when all of this came crashing down on the Radiohead drum technician. Today, at the inquest into his death, explosive admissions from the owner of the company that built the stage. Specifically about this one part, a truss that was supposed to help bear the heavy roof load. It's garbage, Dale Martin said of the truss component. It never existed. This drawing was always wrong. And still the stage went up again and again, and finally and fatally at Toronto's Downsview Park. Martin took responsibility for the tragedy. The system failed. My people, me, I'm responsible. For Scott Johnson's father, Ken, it was hard to take in. It's ridiculous. It, it is, you know, Scott should be here. Um, they, uh, they, we've been talking about this trust all week and that everybody admits never existed. The inquest heard evidence the people who put the stage together year after year worked around what Martin perceived as a design flaw. That's exactly the danger of the complacency, right, is that people are relying on the fact that we've done this and numerous times before without incident. This forensic engineer has been following the case for years. What I heard in there was ridiculous. To see that kind of deviation from what is expected in a design and what's actually built, I've never seen anything like that. After this collapse, the Downsview stage is no more. But it has a sister stage with the exact same design, sold to a company in Osaka, Japan, where court heard it's still standing today. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. I kind of want to do this next one in a really high voice, but I can't. Ahead tonight, how a helium shortage could affect everything from your health care to your smartphone. And a little later, a tough trade for Jays fans. They are losing Superman. What makes this so emotional for you? It's all I've ever known.
sign of shedding tears. All this money, power, fame, and I can't make you reappear, but I'll wipe them though. Los Angeles police have arrested a suspect in the murder of rap star Nipsey Hussle, who was shot dead on Sunday in front of his L.A. clothing store. 29-year-old Eric Holder is a known gang member, but police believe he had a personal dispute with Nipsey. Last night, there was chaos at a vigil for the murdered musician after a man brandished a gun. At least 19 people were injured, ratcheting up tensions in this neighborhood. Nipsey was known there for his community activism, fighting gang violence and trying to improve people's lives. Today, the CBC's Kim Brunhuber heard firsthand what Nipsey meant to people in that neighborhood and to ask whether anyone else will try to take up his mission to make a difference. Here they come down the alley, 25 at a time, under the watchful eyes of the LAPD. These days, authorities don't even trust the community to mourn in peace. The street outside Nipsey Hussle's store, Marathon Clothing, was shut down after a vigil last night turned violent. So Corey Jones pays his respects from behind the police tape. He started off small, you know what I'm saying? Jones used to see the man he calls Nip around the neighborhood, and like his idol, Jones has his own clothing line. Ten years ago, Nipsey was selling socks and t-shirts in the parking lot. Then he came back and bought this building and planned to buy more, hoping to stave off gentrification that was nibbling away at this historically black neighborhood. It was like we going backwards. Now we're about to go backwards. Like, who else going to come out here and open up their own business in the community? Van Babers, who volunteers at a ministry next door to Nipsey's store, still can't believe his neighbor is gone. If you ask me about his music, I have very little knowledge of that. But I do know the man, and I'm telling you, uh, he's inspirational. His legacy, one of empowerment. We could buy stuff, we could own stuff. That was his key thing. Now, the Nation of Islam, which has been trying to broker peace in the area since Nipsey's death, says it's time for another black star to grab the baton. So what Nipsey was doing need to be expanded. You know, so the Snoop Dogs of the world, the Dr. Dre's of the world, they need to come and finish his legacy. For the community, this is a wake-up call. Anti-violence advocates say education is the only way to stop these arguments that end with the winner in jail and the loser in the cemetery. We have to work at it as a public health issue and not a gang issue, not something that comes into the community to hurt us. These are our own children and community members that are hurting us the most. The first test, he says, Nipsey's funeral. If the community can get through that without further bloodshed, he says, that's a start. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. And we have a lot more ahead tonight on The National, including what's behind a serious shortage of helium around the world and why that affects far more than just party balloons. And it's kind of a disaster because if, if I'm in the middle of an experiment at low temperature and I can't get helium, I have to stop. The city of Chicago has made history tonight, electing its first African-American female mayor. Voters chose former federal prosecutor Lori Lightfoot in a runoff vote. When she's sworn in, Lightfoot will also be Chicago's first openly gay mayor. Ontario MP Tony Clement says he will not run for re-election this fall. He's been sitting as an independent since being kicked out of the Conservative caucus in November in a sexting scandal. It came to light after he sent sexually explicit images to someone online and they tried to extort him. In a statement today, he said it's time to move on. My personal life is back on track after the personal crisis I created and that better lived life will continue. Well, it is the second most abundant element in the universe, but here on Earth, there's a major shortage of helium. Supplies are shrinking, prices skyrocketing. It's putting a damper on the party balloon business. But the problem runs far deeper than just that. As Aaron Saltzman shows us, helium is used worldwide in ways you may never have considered. What's a party without balloons? But paying for these party favors going up and up and up. has some people feeling deflated. And I've had to think twice about the decorations, whether I can afford to have the balloons for the party. Helium costs have soared. I used to get those tanks for $100, and now they're run, running about like 300 Helium balloons may be one of those little luxuries one can easily do without, but they're also a harbinger of a potentially far more serious problem. 
Helium may be the world's most versatile gas. It's used to make smartphones, fiber optic cables, semiconductors. Scuba divers use helium, so do welders. There's helium in computer hard drives, in MRIs, in particle accelerators. Nuclear fusion research uses helium. But in spite of its many uses, there are very few sources. Just 14 liquid helium plants in the entire world, and for about the last year or so, some of them have been having problems. And there have been various planned and unplanned uh, plant maintenance outages which have taken additional capacity off the market. A handful of Canadian companies have started drilling for helium in Saskatchewan and Alberta, hoping to cash in on higher prices. But these types of operations account for only about 3% of the world's helium. The rest is a byproduct of natural gas production which means helium producers can't easily or quickly increase supply. John Beamish uses liquid helium to study the fundamental properties of materials at temperatures close to absolute zero. No helium, no research. That could happen, and it, it's kind of a disaster, because if, if I'm in the middle of an experiment at low temperature and I can't get helium, I have to stop and then all of the data taking and work I've done is generally wasted. He's okay for now because of long-term contracts, but this is the third helium shortage since 2006, and this one may outlast those contracts. Back at the balloon store, owner Tammy Still is struggling to avoid passing on her higher costs. Not about the money for me, it's about the fun and doing the balloons. And no one in this business wants to be a party pooper. Aaron Saltzman, CBC News, Toronto. The moment is up next on The National, but first. In case you missed it, Toronto's Superman is flying away. The Blue Jays traded Kevin Pillar to the San Francisco Giants for three players, a move that hit Pillar hard. I spend more time with people here um, than I do with my own family, so. That, that, that part of it's hard. And his time in Toronto really has been all he knows. First drafted in 2011, Pilar was the Blue Jay with the longest tenure on the team. And with moves like this, and this, and this, Pilar makes the catch! It's easy to understand how Pilar got his nickname and quickly became a fan favorite. A little bit disappointed. A little bit disappointed. I, mean, I understand everything, you know, the reasons and everything, but, you know, going to the Jays game tonight, was hoping to see him. Always has to be those Superman catches, man. Just like right in the backfield, jumping catch it, hits the wall. Oh, it's beautiful. But as Jays fans look toward a future without Pilar, the team sent its parting words in a tweet. Thank you for everything, Kevin Pilar. You will always be our Superman. Dan Cartnell has been a bellman at the Sheraton Cavalier in Saskatoon for 50 years, 5-0. For five decades, he has greeted hotel guests at the door, answering any questions they might have. But now Dan's retiring, and today he walked out of the hotel for the last time, and his final day is our moment. Good morning. How are you this morning? Good, thanks. Good. I'm doing well, thank you. <laughs> I tell everybody that's been asking, I say that's my younger evil brother. But that's me back in the mid-80s, roughly. That's not a handout for tip, by the way. That's a greeting to people, welcoming to the Sheriff Cavalier. I take pride in what I do, and I do it to the best of my ability. I'm going to miss the people more so than anything else. I'd like to say uh, thank you because uh, they uh, for helping me out. I had tough days, the bad days. Made me a better person to help other people. So party time now. Goodbye. I'm out of here. We'll see ya. See everybody. Goodbye. I'll get my own door. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get my own door. That's good. So, so besides learning that he's just, you know, like a wonderfully nice guy, uh, I learned that I actually have something in common with him, and that is, so he says, favorite part of his job, uh, interacting with different people and hearing their stories. I agree. Very nice. Classic. And he's also met Kiss, uh, Kenny Rogers, and Johnny Cash, so the perfect job, really. Hmm. Okay, so think about this for a second. Kiss, so the front man, Gene Simmons. I don't know if you guys have read much about Gene Simmons, but he makes a lot about his uh, extracurricular activities. So he spent time in Saskatoon 
Dan, I think there's a story in there for us. Oh, yeah, I bet you you have some secrets to tell. <laughs> We're here. We're available. That's the National <laughs> for April 2nd. Good night. Good night. Good night.